So now we have Ime coming. So Ime, uh, just try. So first, the, the first name I'm getting in right, Jean Laplante. No. <laughs> so for you guys who don't know this very smart lady here, she gave already a meetup. We met back in December. We had a secret Santa in December. And I discovered her. She discovered me, and we starting like we really like each other. This lady is so bright, and I've always wanted to be a doctor in something. And she's like, oh my God, she's, this lady knows she's a scientist, and her title actually is big data scientist for the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, FDFA. You guys are not helping me with those long titles and bios today. <laughs> so to introduce Ime, um really. I mean, there were, I could say, many things, but when she gave the meetup and the topic of big data, I'm not knowledgeable about this topic, and I don't want to be. I don't want to be an expert on topics that are not my, <laughs> in my scope. Uh, when I challenged her to come for the meetup and make it accessible, she did it, and she did it brilliantly. And today, her other challenge, or maybe it was not a challenge, was really to have this vision of a big data how it is linked to digital transformation, and how really it can help company have better business performance. So to introduce you, um, Ime analyzes media data for diplomatic purposes at present Switzerland, if you don't know them, a unit of the Swiss government. Okay. <laughs> she lived four years in Tokyo, Japan, where she trained computers and a few humans, I love this buyer, <laughs> to turn data into better business decisions. Previous, previously, she earned a PhD, so Dr. Ime, in physics from the University of Chicago, where she was awarded the Yachts Prize, for those who don't know, it's just something that's so big, for outstanding experimental work. She contributed to the discovery of the X boson, the simple thing, right? As a researcher at the European Center for Nuclear Research, CERN, in Geneva. So, I mean, I said it all, I think. Welcome, Ime, and thank you for being here. Thanks so much. Good Tanisha. luck. How's the sound? Can you hear me in the back? Great. So thank you to all the organizers and thank you for being here. It's a real pleasure to have this uh, chance to share and also I'm looking forward to hear from uh, all of you the questions and other presentations today. Um, I, uh, I'm overwhelmed by your introduction, as always. <laughs> and. Uh, um, I guess that, that's a good lead-in to, to say that I'm coming from the sciences. Uh, that's why I chose this title, From Tech to Tradition, because where I'm working now is not what you usually would associate with the sciences, uh, a part of the Swiss government. Also, I'm coming from a different direction as an American in the Swiss government. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that journey, how I come from the tech side and another country uh, to be here now. And then the coming back part is uh, the transition, the transformation that we're making within present Switzerland, embracing technology. I, I see we forgot to put, I forgot, I don't know what happened, to put your, your Twitter handle, so can you just say again your Twitter handle? Okay, I have it on the last slide too, but it's uh, at capital J, capital L, capital P, and then the rest of my last name. Thank so, you. JL Plant. We are almost trending. <laughs> <laughs> just a few more, everyone makes a difference. And then I'll, I'll finish up with a section about opportunities around big data and uh, digital transformation um, that may um, interest also for your business, the directions that we're thinking for the future. So how many of you have already gotten on Facebook uh, the update about data privacy? Um, as we prepare for GDPR, great. Okay, now keep your hand up, this is a good chance to stretch, if you also went into the settings and had a look at the information that they have about you, the data. That's been a nice journey, hasn't it? <laughs> it's hard even to find the settings, there's not always the word, right, just a little symbol. Um, so the last time when I spoke at the, the meetup uh, for Geneva, I had the different flags of the countries that I lived in, but conveniently now I can just go on Facebook uh, and they have most of the places that I've been. <laughs> Saves a lot of time, you might want to snapshot things about your interests. I especially like the section categories. I am a close friend of expats, for example. Um, so some of my journey places that I lived, as I mentioned, I was born and raised in the United States. Um, then I came to Switzerland for particle physics uh, to work at CERN. 
And uh, most recently, I've lived in Japan for the past four years. So that's been my transition from being in Tokyo, working in uh, technology and the high pace of things, and then coming back here and embracing the nature, uh, getting that Ricola feeling. <laughs> so um, for this first part about the transition um, from technology, when I was at CERN, um, a lot of what I did is what you think of as data mining. And, uh, Part of mining is also getting your hands dirty. So this is a picture of me uh, down in the cavern. I was working on one of the experiments that's actually underground and uh, dealing with uh, basically plumbing in this case, because those are the, <laughs> the two parts of, uh, of big data. Uh, it's, it's not just about uh, the insight side, but sometimes you have to gather it and you have to clean it and you do have to get your hands dirty. So part of a PhD in particle physics is working with computers and doing analysis, data mining, but also just checking things are plugged in. <laughs> That's always a basic um, first check. Um, we do also have the technology side. So uh, this is a picture of the control room where we're running the experiment, all the different uh, systems and collecting this data, millions of channels, providing uh, little pieces of information that we put together to have a picture. And um, you can think of these machines and big data as being sometimes a camera. People talk about a time machine, a microscope, all these uh, different ways. And, uh, that, for me, is, is part of what it means to have big data. How many of you have heard a, a definition you're happy with for big data, have a good sense of what big data is? Oh, we had this discussion. Uh, Tyson wanted me to do the, the four Vs. You've probably heard no, this. I didn't oh, you didn't want me to do that one? OK. The, then I'll tell you, for me, it's about this transformation, the fact that now, as we move to digital, as we have uh, what you can think of as the Internet of Everything, so Internet of Things, which we'll hear more about later, plus people, all of this information is going into a machine-readable format. That's this opportunity that we have it digitized, and we can use that to learn with processes like machine learning and gain new insights, new structures and organization to that information. So it's about going from the usual questions, but then all of these assets that we have of recording all that information in a digital format. And so this is one example of a machine that's recording information from the world, from these collisions of particles and going at a very small scale uh, in a format where we can then visualize it and learn from it and understand all the structures. Um, some of the things that I've done in data caused people uh, at, at the last uh, Women in Digital to, to crinkle up their head. And it, I mean, as we talk about these privacy issues, it's more and more a uh, question of surveillance and when data is being collected ab about us, and I'll talk uh, more about that towards the end. But in general, there is this hunger am among companies now for data, and um, it's amazing the creativity that's involved in collecting different kinds of data. So you know about cookies and everything that's being collected online. Um, uh, some of the work that I've done is to make sure that we have the same kind of insights for uh, offline data. So to, to do the equivalent of um, seeing when people are visiting a store, when they're coming back, and how long they're staying. Um, there's this thirst for data, and uh, a lot of tech companies are embracing that. Um, this is something we think about uh, for technology, but for government, um, it depends which part of government you're in. You might think of it for government security, but present Switzerland is the communications branch of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. So what we're interested in is the image of Switzerland abroad. This is closer to thinking about uh, tourism, about very traditional images. So cows, for example, it does come up. Cheese and chocolate, mountains, uh, the traditional images of Switzerland, but there's more to it than that. And that's part of where this transition comes in. We don't want to be limited uh, by that box because that's going to limit the, the scale of things that we can accomplish on a global scale and the connections that we can build. And so when people ask this question, why would present Switzerland, this government agency doing communications, want to be doing data science? It's because they want to become a tech company. And I think Every company now wants to become a tech company. This is, this is the digital transformation. In fact, um, it's hard to find companies that can afford to not become tech companies, to, to make this a part of their business. And a big reason for this is the network effects, um, that as you add people into your business, if they're creating value for each other, that's going to strengthen the overall picture. Uh, what's great is that with social networks, we can incorporate that into the business that we want to make sure that the value that people add by engaging on those social networks is more than just liking something, but really contributing to the discussion, bringing uh, a message and uh, something that you're going to take away from those interactions. 
I think about networks as well in terms of the way we connect within the business, because, um, for example, at Present Switzerland, we have a digital team, and they're working with social media. We have a monitoring team, and they're coming from the traditional part, so working with uh, media like print media, um, all of the journals that you would uh, look at, New York Times, for example. Um, and we have events team, so another part of the work is that we have um, events such as the Olympic Games, where we have the pavilion, the House of Switzerland. And so connecting up all of those different teams, uh, the digital transformation gives us an opportunity to bring those people together. And we're looking at the same data, we're looking at it in different ways, make sure that we connect those up and share the messages that we take away. So how do we do that? How do we go from traditional Switzerland with the cheese and the chocolate, and these teams uh, each focused uh, on their own views, to um, a larger picture that we're all working together? Well, a part of this transformation and in incorporating the technology is a transition from things that we're doing with people to how we can do those more with computers. Um, so the human labeling, we have news media that's coming in all across the world in all the different languages and locations, um, and the work of understanding what's emerging, what is the image of Switzerland in all of these news media. We do that uh, with people reading the articles and uh, reporting on things like what is this uh, talking about, what is the subject matter, and then um, what is the sentiment, or the tonality of the article, is it positive or negative uh, on these different topics. And now, with these kind of uh, assets of information that's been uh, labeled, we can take that into an automated platform and we can do that at scale because we start to have more of this than can be done on a case-by-case -case basis. That's uh, the volume of the data is growing, and over time we want to automate it. And here we start to have the challenges of automation because the question is always, what is good enough? Are we going to achieve 100% automation, and that's going to be sufficient? If we only achieve 80%, can we be happy with that? Is that going to be reliable enough to accomplish our goals? In general, um, we find this performing pretty well, but then the next stage of the transformation is to go towards custom algorithms. So there we build uh, out our own tools to complement the platform systems. The first step to this, as I mentioned, is getting your hands dirty to pull together the data. Um, the challenge here is that we want to do this across different countries different languages, different regions, and so we do use uh, commercial tools in this case. We work also with startup partners to develop uh, alternatives to these kind of tools um, to make sure that we get a volume and a coverage uh, that's global and that the tools are working in different languages, um, except maybe Swiss German. That's one of the bigger challenges. <laughs> the, that's one that we really uh, hope that startups are advancing because there's less incentive for the big companies. So um, part of this landscape is that there's room for the small companies and the large ones um, each to have their specialties. Once we have that data, another thing uh, to take into consideration is the difference between the structured data and the unstructured data. Um, most of what we're receiving, unstructured data, is just text. People write about whatever they want. They throw in an emoji when they like. Uh, it doesn't look like an Excel file when you get it. Well, you can put it in an Excel file, but then there's one really messy column which is the full text. Uh, and that's where all the good stuff happens, actually, most of it. Um, and so part of working with unstructured data is to go in there and figure out what is meaningful. So this is just a small example. It's a tool that you could go on and play with um, because the, the other one is a commercial platform. Um, but you can put in a piece of text and you can understand what are the different uh, parts of speech um, and what are the important themes to be able to reduce that and focus on what are some of the key issues. So here you see that they identify uh, different types uh, of uh, topics that might uh, be included, such as uh, people versus uh, places or, or themes. Also, which are the most important ones? And uh, the technologies behind this are always evolving and improving, so it's worth to go and play with the tools uh, and, and see different versions and see the ones that work best for your type of text or for your type of unstructured data, because that's another uh, part of the tools, that the tool might be developed with one type of data, like uh, restaurant reviews or Wikipedia, and then with some work, you can transition it to apply to another type of data through providing the proper feedback and sort of tailoring it to the problem in hand. What we can do with this is then we can absorb a large volume of data and identify within it what are the important themes. So uh, this is an example. If we take 10% of the Twitter stream in English uh, related to Switzerland last seven days and just look from that, what's going to come out as important themes? The, the words are sized by volume. They're colored according to different of these categories, recognizing the types of words that are involved. 
Um, so you can see people, for example, in the um, very light green color, David Goodall. Uh, do you know about David Goodall? That's been important in the last few weeks for the image of Switzerland abroad because uh, this is uh, an Australian scientist, 104 years old, who um, decided uh, that he wanted to end his life, and he had to come to Switzerland to do that because it was uh, legal and possible here where it wasn't there. So those kind of themes, um, maybe in Switzerland that wasn't making a lot of waves. We have to go to a tool like this to make sure that we're aware of that as it's emerging and have some discussion about whether we should provide uh, material informing about uh, Switzerland's position on assisted suicide. Um, so you see different themes that come out from this. You can also see locations where the discussions are coming up. Um, blockchain is on there. Uh, everybody loves the blockchain. Uh, here's an example of context and also um, the volume. So another, another topic uh, that came up was about gun control in Switzerland. And this was coming from the US. The spike that you see there is uh, after there was a school shooting and uh, each time that happens and the discussion explodes about gun control in different positions. Um, and we saw, we got the feeling, oh, this is mentioned a lot in connection with Switzerland. We did an analysis. How much is that being mentioned in connection with Switzerland? So this particular chart is showing the volume specifically connected with Switzerland, and you do see that spike, and then it's kind of, there's some bumps, which is interesting. Um, but the other part of the context that I want to mention here is to know how important is that topic with respect to the overall conversation. So why people mention Switzerland with the gun control is they want to throw it out as an example and say, well, there's a lot of guns over there, but how are the crime rates? And there's real information and fake information, and it's all sloshing around. But as a percentage at that time of the overall conversation on gun control that was exploding, this was only about 0.2%. So that's part of what we can learn with this platform. And then that informs our decision, well, do we need to go in there and enter into this discussion? Do we need to rush to provide a lot of material about gun control in Switzerland? Or is it exploding in a larger sense that's not really connected with Switzerland? And they're just jumping on this occasionally um, as uh, an example to illustrate. So you want to have that overall context of the discussion. Although we care, I mean, a lot of social networks, it's about vanity, right? So we care that people are mentioning us, but we need to know how that is relative to what they're really talking about, what's the true interest um, that's bringing them to this topic. So I mentioned that the, the bumps are interesting. Um, that's another part of this transformation, to be aware about other people using automation, to, to be looking at how they're pulling really old articles sometimes that they've been storing just to sort of jump on these topics, um, and then the way those are being distributed um, with the bot networks, for example. So there's a lot of very interesting developments around that, and I like to put all this under this category, this algorithmically modify data, because that's a way to kind of get a sense of what's happening with the data. Uh, we all have a feeling for food, right? Genetically modified food is something that we think about. And so in the same way with data, we should think about when we're consuming it, where it's coming from. What's, what's been done to it before it came to us? And, uh, and so another part of the transformation is this awareness. Oh, what did I eat today? Was this, was this clean? <laughs> Um, and so there's a lot of questions that come out around that. It's very exciting that people are, are becoming uh, more and more aware because it's the kind of thing that once you start to think of it, once we open those discussions, um, it doesn't go away. Uh, and, and that's the, the first steps in the right direction to, to be aware of what we can, what we can trust and um, what we're putting out there and sharing, the impact that that has, uh, as was mentioned earlier by Lydia, uh, you're endorsing it when you're sharing it, right? Um, a lot of times with these automation processes, um, in the beginning you have the bots that are going to spread the information, and then you have people who see it and then endorse it. And so even when there's an effort to clean up later, to remove fake followers, there's always uh, impacts that come from those automation stages, uh, because real people are involved at different stages in the process. Um, so another area that has a lot of hype around big data, uh, a lot of misunderstanding, um, is the field of machine learning and then specifically deep learning because, uh, how many of you heard of deep learning? Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, even being aware that this is happening is important. If you look in, in like Google Trends, for example, there's a lot of comparison among countries. Who is asking questions about artificial intelligence and, and thinking about deep learning is important because that those, even people who aren't touching the technology themselves, those are shaping the policy, uh, how we're going to be using them, the creativity about what would be possible applications, what we can accomplish with these. Uh, and it's important that those discussions are going beyond the techies, uh, that we connect up with our traditional institutions. 
Um, but just to say about deep learning, some of it is hype, some of it is real. I was reluctant for a really long time to embrace deep learning, but I would say I've fully embraced it now. Um, what's important is what we can get out of it. Um, part of what distinguishes it from other kinds of machine learning is that uh, you have hidden layers. So it's, it's a network kind of simulating the brain, that's the artificial part, where you're making decisions at different points. But with deep learning, you have some layers of the decision making that are going to take information in and pass information along, and we're not really going to ask them what they were doing there. What was the result at that point? How was the decision make it, made? We have ways to access that, but generally it's kind of black box in the middle. And that's where we start to get in trouble, questions of interpretability. But when you apply it in the right way, and uh, one of the examples I'm going to have here is for computer vision, um, as long as you can clearly understand what you're putting in and what you're taking out, generally that solves some of these problems. You don't need to understand at every single stage uh, what it's doing. And they open up a lot of possibilities where in the past problems with text and uh, images, uh, we approached it from uh, like analyzing the parts of speech, and it required a lot of expertise about language to, to structure that and, and to build those. It's really been a long process. With processes like deep learning, we're able to make a leap forward with the computers where we don't actually care about all that structure. That's all happening in the box part. Um, but the, the machine is approaching in a different way than our usual human way of solving that problem and arriving still at useful results. So to show you for computer vision, um, when you ask a computer, is this a picture of, in this case, women, right? Um, they're not going to look necessarily for the same things that we do. And then you can play around with this to start to take um, uh, pictures that have been blurred or small bits of them. And the computer can still fairly accurately say, more accurately than humans, for sure, in a certain limited context. We can also trick the computers. It's amazing how you can take a picture which, to a human, we would say, definitely, this is a turtle. And by changing key pixels, you can trick the computer. Um, so we want to use them in the correct way. Um, so to give you an example of how we've uh, used this in uh, present Switzerland, first, uh, each year we have the image of Switzerland in foreign media, the perception of Switzerland. This is coming from, uh, I see some laughs. It's probably Roger Federer, right? <laughs> Our number one ambassador. <laughs> um, so the image of Switzerland in the foreign media, um, coming from all of this, this process of analyzing the news that's coming in, um, figuring out what are the themes, whether uh, it's being treated in a positive or a negative way. Um, you see mountains are on there. There's a lot about nature. In, in that case, there was also the landslides, so the glaciers collapsing. Uh, Switzerland kind of engaging in this discussion uh, about uh, climate. And so what we did, what we added in this year, is to flip that around and say, well, what about on Instagram? We looked at the serious stuff. Let's, let's go have some fun with this. What is the image of Switzerland on Instagram? Uh, and to do this, one way would be to look at the text and the hashtags, but we chose to do it with the pictures themselves because that's where the content is. And we passed those uh, through computer vision, in this case with the Google Vision uh, API. And there's about uh, six million images that we looked at, so that helped a lot quicker than, than trying to figure it out with people. Uh, and see what are the emerging themes. And some of this, we learned something that we wouldn't have seen from the hashtags, especially if you take the, the largest, which is sky. People are not really going to hashtag that. I mean, you might take a really beautiful sunset, but most of the time you're not going to be like, oh, it's sky and sky again. But the computer sees that there's sky because they're shooting outdoors. That's what we learned from this, that most of the images about Switzerland on Instagram, uh, it's very connected with the outdoors. You see also mountains, water, trees. It connects a bit with our uh, analysis also on foreign media. How does this help us? Well, in terms of positioning and campaigns, uh, what I share with you here, this is just coming out. We have the press release. I'm not sure if it's like actually out. But um, so our, our new project, making fully this transition to tech, uh, and I'm really glad we'll have the talk later from uh, We Robotics. Uh, Switzerland, home of drones. So we'll be at the Viva Technology uh, Salon in, uh, in Paris uh, towards the end of this month uh, with a big stand, the Swiss Pavilion, all of the startups and uh, innovation around uh, Swiss drones and, and drone innovations. And uh, this picture captured it that you have sky, you have mountains. This is a good fit for us. And so in that way, we're able to connect the traditional with the tech. And, and bring those together. Why, why does Switzerland uh, want to be on these topics? Well, you can see that it's a natural fit. Um, what are some of the other opportunities around big data? Um, one that uh, we've been looking at, maybe you know that the Pope is coming to Geneva in June, so we were having some conversations preparing. That'll be a, a big event for us. Um, but we were also talking about um, Artificial intelligence is one way to put it. I also like this, this term, I think it's Oracle, that started to call it adaptive intelligence. Um, 
And a very uh, interesting area of adaptive intelligence is with the chatbots, uh, whether those are being voice controlled or with text. Um, we were looking initially at an example where, where you have the, the fake pope bot, the young pope, <laughs> um, really uh, being provocative. But then, look, the Vatican itself is playing with chatbots. So this is not so disruptive. This is starting to be mainstream. These are the technologies um, that, uh, that are transforming. Another area is uh, using big data for discovery. So to get out of our filter bubble, um, one thing that happens on social media is that we want to have like-minded people, as was mentioned earlier, but at the same time, it's important to understand other views, and that is increasingly difficult when we have uh, personalization and uh, filtering all, all the content that's coming to us. Um, so you can use tools like this. Uh, it, it's similar to extracting the, um, the, the information in the articles I was showing before, that you can put in things that you're reading and try to see the themes and then try to look at an alternative source that you wouldn't normally look at, but that's talking about uh, the same types of themes. Uh, well, we have to mention the blockchain, don't we? <laughs> um, since I'm on kind of this traditional farming uh, view, the example that I have below is about uh, blockchain for turkeys. Um, and that sounds trivial, but underneath it is that a huge opportunity for blockchain is uh, food supply chain. And it comes back uh, like the genetically modified food, for example, and, and trust. Fundamentally, it's about whether we know how things are coming to us as they're moving all around uh, through these uh, global flows, and um, where, where did that come from, whether it's a turkey uh, or a tweet. And what we can learn from this uh, at present Switzerland, well, we're not rolling out any blockchain product that I know of right now, but there's pieces of blockchain technology that are very interesting, such as this transparency and uh, ability to see the different steps that have been involved. So where it leads us is towards more openness and being able to let people interact with the data and the conclusions that we've drawn. Another area is crowdsourcing. Um, so this is the tool that was developed by a team at uh, EPFL in Lausanne. And um, here you can get through an important step of the, of the process of working with big data, which is the labeling. So there's lots of data out there, but in order to make it meaningful, we have to attach labels. Uh, for example, with the text, this is positive or negative, whether it's relevant to the topic of interest. And what they've done here is to crowdsource that, um, where it's kind of like a game. Anyone can go on this site, and they'll show you some tweets. It's about as fun as actually going on social media, but you're providing value at the same time. Um, and providing your input, is this about a certain topic or not? Is it positive on a certain scale or negative? Uh, and over time, this allows, uh, the, the example here is with health, that they can detect um, sentiment towards vaccines, areas where people might be uh, starting to not vaccinate, and then whether that's gonna be able to predict outbreaks of disease because they're not vaccinating. So it seems um, trivial, and it should be fun in order to, to have this crowdsourcing movement. There's a lot of gamification, but the underlying themes are very important that we can use social media um, to have social change. Data protection. How many of you heard this example that, that's held up a lot uh, with Target predicting a pregnancy? Yeah, some of you, it's kind of an older one, but it was like kind of a shocker that, oh, data analytics has reached this point where they can predict a pregnancy before the, the friends and family of someone knows, maybe before that person really knows. Uh, and the issue in that case, it was like a teenager and they sent uh, marketing material and then the dad was all upset, something like this. Um, but then the question around that is, do they know when everyone is pregnant? So the article at the bottom is about somebody who tried to keep her pregnancy secret as an experiment uh, in working with big data, and it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's not something that you want to do every day. Um, uh, the picture here is, is just a random one, but maybe some of you have seen on social media a lot of people sharing the ultrasound picture. That's always one where I'm like, okay. Uh, it's already, I admit I sold a child on Instagram basically with the pictures because, uh, hey, it works. But the uh, ultrasound picture, like, there's not going to be consent and uh, it's a very early stage. Um, so it's, it's a decision we make every time we go on there, share or not share. And so I like this quote, who wants to be someone, seen as someone who doesn't share? I mean, the, the data privacy, uh, now there's these consents that we have to uh, provide. Everyone's seen that screen on Facebook. Uh, I guess, who stopped using Facebook after seeing that screen? <laughs> right? Because that would be not sharing, right? That would be closing ourselves off and, and leaving the network, and so that's a very difficult thing to do. 
Um, so finally, just to close with a very traditional Swiss image, uh, I'm back to the cows here, AI for good. I've been in a, another conference that's going on right now in, in Geneva uh, of this topic, AI for good. How can we use artificial intelligence to improve um, across different areas? And uh, I've given you all these farming examples. I think that agriculture is uh, a key one. In this one, one of the questions that you get with data privacy is about facial recognition. So just to say that people are being very creative, this can be applied now for cows. <laughs> so it doesn't make us special, it doesn't make us human that we can uh, use this facial recognition technology. Now every cow can have um, their personal account. And as we reach this level of technology, it is very important that we think about how we're using it for good. Uh, what, what are the, the motives, the bias, the trust? Uh, it's not enough anymore to say, oh, it's a technology and it's fun and I'm just going to use it. But um, is it making cows happier? Is it making people happier? That's what I have. Thank you, Ime. <laughs> I mean, uh, like these first two presentations, I, what can I say? It was really nice. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope we have questions. Remember, randomly, going to pick someone if I don't. <laughs> so who's first? OK, so let's try and keep the question short so we can have three questions uh, for Ime. Thank you. Can because we are we want to promote women and people, so please state your name. I'm Carla Beckman from MindMaze, a startup in Lausanne. I just wanted to ask. I really love the presentation; super fun. I um, uh, thought it was interesting that um, the Swiss government is investing in data analytics and somebody like you to really look at these kinds of things. It seems I'm off again. Um, sorry. Um, I uh, was noticing over the last few weeks as Mark Zuckerberg was being um, grilled grilled by the um, American politicians that there's, um, I guess, a perception, a very real one, that politicians in general aren't very enlightened or informed about technology. Um, do you think that's different in Switzerland? Do you think um, the Swiss government's more enlightened? And it's related question around um, the big five and regulation, and if the Swiss government's more enlightened, I know it's a blockchain is, and is a big, big deal for um, Switzerland at the moment, um, if that's something that you see is going to be helpful for them in terms of being competitive in the future, and what's the role of regulation around that? Okay, the regulation question. So now it's a very interesting time, as you know, for regulation, um, because there's all the talk about the general data protection regulation, but it's, uh, it's, it's going to take effect on the 25th of May, and then we'll see. What does it really mean? Right. Uh, right now, the big companies are going to align, the governments are going to uh, align as well, and then we're going to see what's uh, happening in terms of execution. Um, and uh, Switzerland hasn't fully taken their position on that because that's the EU regulation, whereas the Switzerland regulation is a little bit uh, behind. So there's still a little bit of uh, leeway uh, or chance to see how it rolls out and, uh, and realign. Um, so I guess I, I don't want to take uh, preemptive uh, view on that right in the moment uh, when it's rolling out. In terms of uh, data savvy within the government agencies, it's something um, that we're working on. Uh, I'm in a course right now which is uh, data diplomacy. There's an association in Geneva that's providing this service. Um, but it's also, uh, everyone is going around and asking everyone else, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and then what should we do? And uh, are we ahead, are we behind? Everyone's asking these questions. In this AI for Good conference yesterday, there was someone sitting next to me, and he was kind of saying, I'm gathering information for that course. And I was like, well, you know, I'm in the course, and <laughs> can, can I interview you? And it's, it's kind of, everyone wants to uh, look over everyone else's shoulder, I think, because it's changing so fast. So thank you for the question. Uh, can I just comment on that? Because I am working for an association of the State Secretary of, of uh, Education and Research, so to the government. Thank you. And um, so, yes, there is an update. The Switzerland is issuing an update in response to the GDPR. It's going to be towards the end of this year. Um, and then the second thing was that currently what the government is doing now is they are, um, they are trying to figure out if there is enough... Um, Research is the bottom-up part, which are the, because the Commission has issued a lot of strategies on AI, on blockchain, on a lot of things happened, and Switzerland, because it's an associated state, hasn't taken its position yet. But what the government is doing now is that they are looking at researchers, what they are doing, and see if there is enough mass behind all these initiatives so that we can uh, sign the declarations and then they can join into to that. So. Um, 
if you are, and it's a call for everyone, if you're really working in these areas, and especially you could provide input to the State Secretariat, I'm guessing you do, your bosses do, um, it's really needed because Switzerland hasn't taken a position and us, res well, researchers and us working in these fields are needed to provide support and, and tell them less you have to uh, associate to these ones. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Preparing people. <laughs> Next question. Hey. hey. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Clarissa. Thank you we so much. We are very much. active with questions. Good. Um, and Elon Musk has stated not too long ago that the biggest danger for humankind is AI, is machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, my question to you is mostly I'd like to know your opinion um, for Switzerland. What are the real threats? Are the cows in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously speaking, what's your opinion? What are the biggest dangers? Dangers, yeah. Um, For people like us. Yeah. I think it comes around a lack of understanding. Uh, and I think that the challenge with AI is for us all to be aware at a basic level of uh, how that starts to become a part of our daily life. I think it's an unstoppable force at this point. That's my opinion. I mean, time will tell. Um, but smoothing that integration, we have a personal responsibility to, to have this kind of awareness. Um, with AI, there's a lot of questions that come up around bias. Um, basically, if you blindly take an algorithm and you train it on biased data, then it will come out with biased results. <laughs> um, unlike with people where the, the person with bias might eventually go away, uh, with an algorithm, it can become even more entrenched and then that's the only way the decisions are taken. Um, that's sort of the pessimistic view of that risk. At the same time, with AI, you can have a kind of a marketplace. So if one algorithm is strongly biased in one direction, you create an opportunity for uh, the data mining to see that there's this bias, and another algorithm will come up and take advantage of the, the space that's created from that and make a, a, a selection that goes the other way. So um, part of the intelligence, there's the early stage where it's gonna be kind of rough, and then there's a more advanced stage where the same as we have diversity of people, we have diversity of algorithms, and some of that can be improved. Um, but, but again, uh, it's important that just because we have artificial or maybe better augmented intelligence, we don't stop thinking for ourselves. One last question. Oh, this is like raising. I think it's like doing gym. I see you guys. Mm -hmm. You guys hear the question, everyone? I, I can repeat it. Yeah, yeah so the, the question was about the biggest challenges using predictive analytics. Um, and there, I think one of the biggest problems is rollout, because uh, if you get a result that's wrong at some early stage, that's sufficient to just scrap the whole thing, right? Whereas we talked about before with innovation, it's important to be able to fail, it's important to be able to try. Um, so if, if you have a predictive analytics, it doesn't start at 100% accuracy, and so there has to be uh, a preparation of expectations for those scenarios in which uh, the algorithm is going to be wrong. Um, on this AI uh, for good uh, subject, for example, if you have the algorithm and it's going to produce an improvement over time, then it might be worth considering it, right? We, we need to balance that amount of improvement against um, for example, the transfer of responsibility. When it's, if you told somebody, to, if you predicted something and you told somebody to do it and then they did it because you told them to and then it was wrong, uh-oh, <laughs> right? Um, if they will listen to you the next nine times and you're right, overall you're gonna help them. But if the first time was the 10% the of the time that you were wrong, then it's gonna be a really tough sell to keep going. So there's a lot of thinking that goes and uh, it's important to fully understand the problem and the context that we're gonna apply it to uh, at that early stage and, and prepare all of those edge cases. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ime. Great job.